Okay, thank you, John, for agreeing to do this video, The Benefits of Artists. Uh, we talked yesterday, and you said that you were in finance before, uh, before you became, uh, went full-time as an artist, and then, but the financial part was really helpful for you to learn how to survive as an artist. Yeah, without that, uh, you struggle a lot with the ups and downs of income yeah. coming from uh, not having a paycheck coming in, but rather being an entrepreneur and having to um, anticipate uh, periods of time where you won't be selling anything yeah. and how that would work. And from the beginning, my first year, I ascertained the best I could that the um, it wasn't impossible to have a steady income all year round from just doing the art shows yeah. and the festivals and being on the road a lot or just having a gallery yeah. and depending on it. But rather to do both, both have a gallery and do the shows. When you were on the road, that, that was uh, like festival or? Yeah, was various art shows in art other shows. cities. Okay. Uh, like out in the desert or San Diego or up in Santa Barbara, uh, wherever uh, you uh, have a show that handles the kind of work that you're producing. Right. Uh, you go to where the public is. You can't just make a living at art by sitting and waiting for people to come to you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's no business I know of in the world where that's the case, and why artists think they're exempt from that, I have no idea. But musicians and artists and writers, they have to go to the public with yeah. their product and, and in one form or another market it successfully on a regular basis all year round. That's cool. Um, I, we, we talked yesterday about uh, not going into debt, but what about what? going into debt in order to acquire that audience and acquire that? What do you think about that? Um, it's risky at best. Yeah. Uh, you may have to um, incur some credit card debt for ex to be the expenses while you're doing shows or uh, uh, selling your work in a gallery when there's nothing moving. Uh, but you want to be able to pay it off each month so that you don't incur a lot of interest charges and have the psychological um, struggle with knowing that you're going further and further in debt and you don't see any way of paying it off. <laughs> uh, which most people uh, encounter when they first go into a business for the first time. Yeah. Those first five years, I call it the five-year hump, yeah. where you're just establishing yourself and doing a lot of exposure, if you hope, which will lead to business down the road. Uh, so in your first year or two, uh, I don't know of any artists that really made much of any money their first couple of years. They're lucky to break even, and I was very happy to break even the first couple of years that I started and stopped going to the office and having a regular paycheck. Uh, the fact that I could at least meet my expenses yeah. and uh, I was um, lowered my overhead uh, by moving out of my uh, Ocean View townhome on the south end of town and into a little um, cottage here in the canyon. Yeah. Uh, that made it uh, lowered my overhead by 50% oh, okay. uh, right off the bat, and that enabled me to have. Uh, meet uh, expenses early on without going into much of any debt. Yeah. And I was able to pay off my credit cards as I, each month uh, as I uh, always have done ever since. So I've had no house payments, no car payments, yeah. no uh, credit card payments, and uh, was living very conservatively with, compared to what I was as, a, as an executive. Yeah. Did you have to cut any other costs, or? Well, just naturally, right? Yeah. Um, I was, as a businessman, I was making probably 130,000 the last year that I worked in 91. Okay. Uh, I may recall, and I, I paid 62,000 in taxes, and I said, oh, this is really brutal. Why don't I reverse that? Why do I make 60,000 
and my expenses will equal my income probably, so I won't have to pay much of anything in taxes. Uh -huh. My kids had already moved out on college and on their own, so I had no deductions anymore to oh, okay. write off. It was the reason I had to pay a half in taxes, state and city. So I was making a, a bold move, just stepping out in faith that, uh, yeah. that uh, would be successful. And what encouraged me was that I sold 65 paintings my first year at the Sawdust Art Festival. And I thought oh, instead of going back to work in September, yeah, that I would just keep painting and then do the winter show in November and December and uh, open a gallery in the following year with a couple of other artists right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would give us income between January and June in July when the festival opened because I saw you know the, the spring winter so-called that we have here in Laguna uh, which is very mild uh, would be my slow time because yeah. there's very few shows going on anywhere except out in the desert uh, in Southern California at that time as well uh, so that that would be the time where I would hope to make some money at the gallery. Got it. And uh, sure enough, it worked out quite well. I was able to balance my income uh, from my sales at the gallery and the show. Um, and the, the shows have, I would say, about five times the exposure uh, to customers oh, okay. over a gallery. Gallery, you get a handful of people a day, uh, except on Saturdays and Sundays, where yeah. you may get up up to 25 or 30, but even then, that's a small fraction of what you get at the festivals where they get several hundred to several thousand on any given day. A day. And uh, if just 1% like your work, you've got a chance of making a sale. Oh yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, I just got the call to entry to the Art Affair uh, with myself, and I, I was kind of on the fence on whether to, uh, you know, enter that, but you know, I guess, I don't know. I guess it would be a no-brainer for you to say, just go for it, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I'm a judge, uh, one of the judges there at the Art Affair. Oh. So we review uh, the pieces that are being submitted and give our vote um, between 1 and 10 on the caliber of the work, uh, that whether it's going to be saleable or not. Yeah. There's very little to do with technical expertise, but if it's saleable and unique, yeah. that's what works best at the shows and in the gallery, so far as making a living is concerned. It's not uh, how good you are at drawing or how good you are at uh, detailing a painting. Yeah. That has very little to do with the saleability. The uh, customers are primarily looking for something that it will go with their color decor or in their home or their office mm -hmm. that that speaks to them, that's engaging to them because they either have been to the place that you have painted or it has reminds them of places they've been to in the past mm -hmm. that uh, is meaningful to them. And that's what a good 85 to 90% of your sales are made up with the, those kinds of people. They're relatively affluent, they are well-educated, um, they know what they're looking at so far as quality is concerned. Uh, occasionally you get somebody who just has to have that painting. Oh my gosh, that is so good. And they were, are oblivious of what the price is. They just have to get it. <laughs> yeah. That maybe happens once or twice a year. <laughs> oh, the rest, yeah. you are going to have to make it attractive to them price-wise for them to be able to afford it in their budget and make the purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, they make some impulse by purchases of a small one like uh, this one over here, yeah. which is uh, only nine, uh, about eight by 10, uh, the canvas size. Uh, but uh, the rest, uh, when you're spending two or $3,000 on a painting has to be very meaningful to them. Yeah. And you offer things like delivering the piece of the house, hanging it for them, um, giving them a discount, yeah. whatever it takes to make the sale. Because yeah. cash flow is what making a living as an artist is all about. It's not how much you can sell the painting for that's important, but how often you can move the pieces, moving the product, 
on a regular weekly and monthly basis. Yeah. And that enables you to paint more as you sell more and you improve the quality of your work yeah. uh, as you're practicing. And so th I would say that for the first four or five years, people are basically paying you to practice, if you can believe that. That's the way I looked at it anyway. Yeah. Because the quality of my work when yeah. I first started was mediocre at best, in my opinion. <laughs> no, okay. you're okay. I didn't tell anybody that, but in my opinion, it was the quality There's plenty of people would argue with you. It had all. pretty colors, <laughs> but that was about it. Color design was why people were buying my work, not because of my technical expertise. Uh -huh. uh, and it was uh, mostly uh, French Impressionistic originally style because I wasn't very good at drawing or detailing. Definition was not my strength. It was uh, as a colorist, yeah. that was my strength. Uh, so each artist has their own particular hook that will attract people if they're able to make a living at it. Yeah. That, that sets them apart from the rest of the crowd so that the people will know whenever they have a need for that type of art, they can come to you and get it at a reasonable price. Yeah. So for example, yesterday here at the gallery, I had a couple come in and buy two pieces, two good sized pieces, uh, one was here and one was over there uh, that had purchased from me in 1993. Yeah. Hadn't seen me since. They loved the pieces, they still like them, and they were remodeling and they were coming back for additional artwork. Okay. And it was to go in their hallway and they put it. So uh, th yeah. that's what happens after you've been in the business for four or five years is you start having repeat customers come back to you and ask for additional work if they like what you did for them. And they get a lot of compliments on it from friends and relatives mm -hmm. who come to their house and that reinforces their decision that your work is something that works in their home right. or their office. Uh, and that's a very delightful, really personally satisfaction reward uh, to do that. Uh, the key is keeping your overhead low while you're doing your sell. Price it very reasonably, um, lower than what you would like to have it at, uh, but always being willing to do a discount for the folks because so that's not just one and done, they're going to yeah. come back for more. You mean lower the price more. of the paintings? That's or, right. Or for example, the yesterday one. they bought a big piece this size uh, for a nominal what they thought was a nominal price compared to what they were seeing in other galleries. Yeah. And I gave them half off on the second piece. Uh -huh. uh, well, because they were waffling on the second piece, but they were thinking, yeah. well, maybe if it was reasonable enough, they could afford that one as well too. So I gave them half off. Okay, the they were a prior customer. Uh, and uh, I always like to reward previous customers with at least a 20% discount. Oh, okay. And sometimes half off if they have bought a big, a big one, and because I make my big, I make my money. I pay my overhead on my larger pieces, uh -huh. not the small pieces. The right. smaller pieces, like this or these, are um, grocery money, gas money, <laughs> nominal thing. And, and cell phone. Believe me, that's very important. Yeah, so I never, I, I, I never downplay being able to sell small ones. In fact, you sell, sell a lot more small ones at the festivals than you do a large one. Yeah. But the large ones usually lead to commissions. And commissions, uh, as it turns out, particularly the larger ones, turn out to be at least half to two thirds of your income every year. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't realize that um, when they're just looking at work in galleries that most of the artists are making their largest income and the largest sales on commissions, special pieces. Yeah. And you do that by painting at your booth or painting at your gallery so yeah. it occurs to them there's something more that's possible from this artist than just what I see hanging on the wall. Yeah, I was just uh, down at uh, Heisler Park yesterday painting in watercolor after we talked and cool. I got a commission from a, from a Persian family that was watching me paint. Right on. That's a great <laughs> example. <laughs> Hoorah. I know. It's crazy. They love the work in the book. Yeah. There's a little 
yeah, but yeah. And having a little portfolio, uh, either on your iPad or iPhone, or in, with pictures like this to show to them yeah. that they can browse through, is a big advantage in uh, have, getting commission work. So they'll ask, well, what else can you do? What else have you done? Yeah. And if you have something ready available to show them uh, on the spot, then that will uh, encourage them to go to your website and look for additional pieces as well as at the gallery to see them in person. People are getting a little braver now about buying pieces on the website oh, than they were in the past. Before, they would get interested in what you had on your website, but they'd still want to see it in person before they made a purchase. But once you've got a good reputation for quality in your work and backing up your work, in case it doesn't work out, by that I mean giving them a 90-day uh, return policy, yeah, because that's the time they can reject it on their credit card anyway. <laughs> You're not making any big concession by offering that to them, but yeah. that at least really, if they're buying it back in Vermont yeah. and you're shipping it to them kind of thing off your website, that reassures them that they can return it uh, and you'll honor their um, return, which maybe happens uh, two or three percent of the time. Maybe yeah, one in 20 what wouldn't work out for some reason. They were expecting something different when they saw it on the website. Uh, and and uh, that may happen once in a while, but it's very rare. 98% of the time when they see it, it looks better than what they saw on the website and it works out much better than they anticipated. So that's a very rare thing that does happen. But again, it's a good policy to have her at least a 90 day return yeah. offer to them if they're waffling and not sure if it's going to work out on the spot they have at home to them. No problem. You, I'm welcome to bring it over to your house and uh, uh, help you hang it or you can uh, bring it back to me if it doesn't work out. I, I always need inventory. Uh, yeah. Because my policy is to price it low and let it go. So my inventory is always moving and I always need additional inventory. Uh, just to keep up with the flow of demand, or which is a nice position to be in. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, that way the first few years. I had a lot more inventory that I would, was moving. <laughs> and it was say, you're, the, you're, the, you're the largest collector of your own work. Yeah, indeed, very funny. Exactly <laughs> right. So most people have got this uh, backup, backlog of inventory uh, when you go over to their house. Uh, artists have uh, pieces out in the garage, under their bed, in the closets, yeah. on the walls, and it's not moving any. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, what should I do, John? I said, well, think, look at your prices. Yeah. If your work is not moving, adjust what it needs to be in order for it to start moving. Right. Once it starts moving, then you can bump it up 10% at a time. 10% every... Year. year. 10% a year. 10% um, a year. Yeah, uh, or whatever it needs in order to get, if it's moving too fast at that price. Right. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally the market <laughs> is very strong. And that's usually when the real estate yeah. market is strong. Yeah. We're the tail of the real estate market. That's what I was going to ask if you could predict, uh, if there's any way to predict uh, the tail of the real estate market. Then. Yeah, six months to a year after the real, the strong real estate market has been moving along steadily like it has been in the last six months. Yeah. And a lot of construction activity the, uh, is going on because the demand far exceeds the supply right now in homes, uh -huh. at least in Northern, Southern California. Uh, and so this is a good sign for sales right now and in the rest of the year. Oh. The people will should be buying, if your work is priced at the level that they want to pay mm -hmm. for your the, what they're seeing in your, your work and it compares favorably to other artists pricing then you will do well this year yeah okay wow that's, that's, a, good that's a great insight and, and as far as uh, you talked about investment income yesterday let's Do talk about question. that question yes uh, you want to set aside at least 10 percent of your sales into your savings account uh, uh, each time you make a sale and then invest it in a mutual fund 
is best for most artists. A no loan mutual fund, that is, one that does not have a commission. There's three major companies. And no what? No, no loan, which no means loan. no commission. No commission. No commission. Okay. Most uh, mutual funds take five or six percent right off the top okay. when you give them the money to invest in their mutual fund. But there's three major mutual funds in the country which have been around. Uh, T. Rowe Price has been around since 1936. Fidelity has been around since 1946. And Vanguard, the third one, has been around since 1980. Uh -huh. And they are investing billions of dollars. It's very stable long-term uh, investments that they're making. And I recommend for most artists what they call a balanced fund. A mutual fund that is balanced has half the money in bonds, half the money in blue chip stocks. Yeah. Uh, and that is very stable, an average of eight to 10 percent a year. In really strong years like last year, it was up 35 percent, but that's oh, very, wow. very extraordinary. I was going to say that comes yeah, along amazing. once a decade. We have a year <laughs> like that, uh, so I would expect that's this year to be relatively flat compared to last year. Right. That's typically what happens, but you—that's the ideal time to invest. Uh -huh. Not while the market is going up, but rather it's flat or going down. For a long-term investor, that's when you make the most money because yeah. you're buying it at a lower price. Oh, right. Just like with artwork, you're buying yeah, at a lower price. price. When the art market is soft, than you are when its art market is strong, and you're seeing astronomical prices on work because they're still able to sell at those astronomical prices. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like the supply and demand sort of thing. Total supply and demand. Yeah, and we vary with the activity that's going on in the real estate market, construction yeah. wise, as well as. Uh, Moving sales. So, would you? Would you? And I didn't know that prior to making doing my first show at all. That was a big surprise to me. Find that out. To find. Oh, I'm sorry. To find the, out. the real estate market was oh. what was driving the art market. Okay. Um, so, so were were you? I mean, how did you notice that? How did you come to notice that? Were you talking to people or? or you... Yes, I was asking what they were going to do with this piece and where they wanted to hang it. And, in the course of selling the piece, I would actually try to get them to visualize what they were, this piece was going to go. Uh, and then they would come out with the fact, if they were serious buyers anyway, that they had either just bought a new home or they were remodeling a home. Oh, okay. Uh, and so putting two and two together, being the businessman <laughs> that I am, yeah. I immediately connected the dots and saw. Well, that's when the art market is likely to be the strongest. Yeah. And we had pretty good years in the 90s and around the turn of the century for uh, real estate activity mm -hmm. going on uh, here in Southern California. It's very consistent and it continued to grow rather than just being a big cycles up and down yeah. like it happened in the middle part of the last decade. In 08, we had a real estate uh, financial crash all over the world, and that uh, made uh, uh, art sales collapse for about two or three years. Yeah. I had to do two shows at that point, Moodoo with the Wolf Festival of Arts and the Sawdust Festival, and two galleries as well, just to make the same amount of income that I was doing with just one gallery and one show. That's what I was curious about. Before. I was really curious yeah. about that. So when the market does change significantly, uh, then you have to anticipate that and make moves accordingly. Dropping your prices 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever it takes to keep the art moving and the cash flow going, yeah. rather than just say, I can't lower my prices. My public is going to be, my prior customers are going to be furious with me and I'm going to be devastated, you know. That is not the attitude of any business that I know in the world. Right. You, you, any successful business. Any successful business has to adjust their sales uh, prices in relation to supply and demand. And supply and demand. And demand. Yeah. But most artists don't get that. They think it's kind of a prestigious thing to maintain their prices yeah. regardless. Oh, I see. And yeah. the only direction they will ever move their prices is up. Oh, thank you for saying that. Because. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm one of the, I, I'll take that definitely from today. I call it vanity pricing. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's all that it is, is vanity. Yeah. Saying that your work should have that kind of a price on it because other artists whose work, mine is just as good as theirs, and I should be able to sell my work for five to 10,000 rather than 500 to 1,000 because my work is at that level, yeah. I think. And I'm not gonna discount it just in order to make a sale. Well, consequently, they have all this inventory at home that's not moving. Yeah. And they slow down their process <laughs> of painting too at the same time because they get discouraged. Yeah. That lessens their um, not only enthusiasm. enthusiasm, but the quality of their work starts to level out too, you notice with those artists. Oh, I that, that they're, doesn't, they don't, because they're not painting every day, you're not painting twice a week or once a month because nothing is moving and they get discouraged I and they drift off into something else. Uh, for income purposes, they take a part-time job, a full-time job, because they think they have to in order to meet their expenses. Yeah. But all they have to do is adjust their pricing, and then they're back in the swing of things. Oh, and then, as it starts really moving, then you, as I say, bump it up 10% of the time. Okay. And people don't walk at 10% increases a year uh, when it comes to art and art. In fact, Artwork uh, that if you jump at fifty percent or a hundred percent, then they oh, they get taken aback, right? Uh, uh, and uh, they uh, you know look for something else and less expensive. Yeah. For in terms of um, wall decoration, this is what they think of. That's what we're doing, folks. This is wall decoration. It's not sacred. It's not, <laughs> it requires vanity. It's right. only sacred to us. <laughs> That's right. It's only sacred to us because we don't put our uh, energy and our soul into that piece, yeah. and, and it mean, it's very meaningful to us. Uh, but to the market, and we do it. But nevertheless, to the buying public, it's just wall decoration. There yeah. are maybe ten percent who are collectors, and they are looking at something that, that they figure is very high quality, and they're willing to pay high pricing for that. Yeah. In fact, they brag about the high price they pay to their art to their friends and relatives. Uh, to show you know what good taste they have, <laughs> but that's you can't make your living on those people. You yeah. can't. Uh, well, you said it one or two. Can, in, in maybe for short periods of time, when the art market's very strong, you will yeah. be able to make it on collectors who are willing to pay exorbitant prices. But in, in the long run, that's not enough to uh, be supporting in, for steady income all year round. You'll have you know big. It'll be like on a roller coaster all the time with sales um, very rapidly for a few days or a few months, and then it just goes all of a sudden it's evaporates and like somebody flipped a switch and there's nothing going on at all. You think, what's going on here? Why? I got the same price as I did last year, but nothing's moving this year. What's going on? What do I need to do here? Well, as I say, the 90 Eight percent of the time is adjusting your prices. It's the answer. Yeah. yeah. As painful as it may be, you do it. Oh uh, yeah, that's but the uh, really uh, top quality artists. At that point, you will notice start teaching a lot. Yeah. For regular income, uh -huh. and they become more dependent on their income mostly for teaching than they do for sales of their artwork. Oh, okay. And they'll keep the prices of their artwork up high. In order and, and teach <laughs> and to support their need to teach, and they'll make reproductions of their work mm -hmm. and sell those for a nominal price for cash flow. Yeah, yeah. To pay the, the gas bills and the food bills and that type of thing, they'll go into the reproduction business. Mm -hmm. That will also just flatten out the quality of their work because they won't oh. be painting enough. They'll be doing spending all their time wrapping and framing. Uh, all these reproductions yeah. and selling cards, uh, greeting cards, and all kinds of things with their work on, and depending on that for their income rather than originals. Yeah. I have never done reproductions. Oh, I've always done nothing but originals. My style of work does not reproduce well because yeah. it's not graphic. A graphic artist like Lynn will do very well with reproductions because she's more of an illustrator which do reproduce well, 
rather than an impressionist like me, which do not reproduce very well uh, graphically. Uh, it looks very good in person and it changes its appearance depending on the lighting and the distance, which people find very intriguing. So that's the appeal of my work. Yeah, yeah. But illustration style, uh, which is what most artists have learned in school, um, rather than impressionistic, it does reproduce very well and they tend to do uh, make a, um, a good income on their reproductions. Yeah. But it doesn't help the quality of their work at all because they don't paint as much as they should yeah. otherwise. Well, going back to cash flow, I was, I was really curious about, um, and, and investments, uh, do you think it uh, would be wise for an artist to learn how to analyze stocks? No, not at all. That's a good question. That's why I recommend mutual funds for artists. Uh -huh. So they don't have to follow this fickle stock market, which is volatile based on expectations, right. not based on current results. So they get very uptight and uh, psychotic about oh, swings yeah. in the market which have nothing to do with investing. All that is is based, uh, based on current events right. and that will change significantly over the course of a year or a decade. What you're concerned about as an investor rather than a trader is whether prices are going down in a buying range that you're attracted to for the long run because yeah. you're buying to hold for 10, 20, 40, 50 years, oh, okay. depending on yeah, yeah. what your age level is. Uh, and the, the younger that you get started on a mutual fund investment program, putting in a regular amount every month uh, into your investment account, which you can open for $1,000 in any mutual fund yeah. uh, to do. And then you add increments as you can on a regular monthly basis. Mm -hmm as you pay off your credit cards, that's number one. Then you need money you have left over uh, when you make a big sale. Um, like I did yesterday, half of that uh, I sent into uh, my mutual fund account uh, oh, okay. this morning. Oh. Before I spend it, <laughs> send it out, <laughs> write the check and send it in, or I just go online and I transfer the money from the savings account to the investment account with a click of the mouse or the, or the checking account, wherever the money happens to be. If they, are, they wrote a check to me like the customers did yesterday, um, I just uh, deposit it with, a, with my iPhone, take a picture of it, and then send off the money to my investment account. I gotcha. uh, and then I keep a then I went grocery shopping and I got a whole bunch of the week's groceries, two weeks of groceries, uh, and, and then I'm, I'm set. Uh, I did the right thing. Yeah. I paid off the Amazon account and, I, uh, uh, and then I paid off the, uh, uh, the grocery account and all that good things. And yeah. It has a great feeling uh, when you're able to do that, uh, particularly if you haven't had a sale for a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was one. Of, if you're, you said sale for a couple of weeks, when you say, you know, let's say you had a good year, and what kind of time frame would you think, like, oh shoot, maybe I should, according to supply and demand, kind of like, you know, take your prices back a little bit. What's like a month, two weeks, two months? A month. A month. A month. Yeah. Okay. If I don't have a sale in a month, uh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm doing whatever it takes to start According moving. To the, anxiety. the amazing thing happens when you're able to even sell a little one. It gives you a positive um, aura to talking to people yeah. about instead of a desperate aura or a depressed one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. you're, you're smiling, you're laughing, yeah, yeah. you're in a good mood, and people are immediately attracted to that. Uh -huh. They're not attracted at all to an artist who uh, seems down and out which inevitably they get that, are you selling anything kind of opinion? How are you doing? How are you doing? They start talking to other artists and their work is moving, their work is moving, They're, they get very depressed and the customers sense that immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so I never inquire of any artists how they're doing. Uh, uh, I'm only concerned about how I'm doing in relation to the 
prices that I have on my work, and I'm not looking to have my prices at the level that other artists price. Mm -hmm. uh, my work is priced about half what other artists do for the same size piece. Mm -hmm. And I like to maintain that position because uh, that uh, resonates with the pub buying public. Yeah. Because our buying public here in Southern California are is the family market, not the collector market. Oh, the collector market, as I say, represents about 10% of the market yeah. overall, but the rest is the families. And they're usually on some kind of a budget and a you know, choice when they make a big purchase oh, of hard right. work. It's either that or buying a car or a, buying a couch buying something else that they have to make the decision between the two. Yeah. The collectors have got uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend on on art and the price is not an issue. Right. The only issue is the quality and the, how it will do on the resale market and they're looking at it as an investment. Yeah. How is your work in the long run going to be as an investment? Yeah. And it has a lot to do with your biography, your credentials as to whether or not they're going to buy your piece or not. Yeah. Whether it's going to be prestigious for them and will increase in value as an investment rather than going down. So yeah. scared money goes to investment grade art in recessions, depressions. Uh, so that's uh, a different type of market altogether than what you and I are dealing with. Okay. We're yeah. dealing with the family market. I, the noticed, I noticed that the people who buy my work are mostly, uh, you know, family, you know, mostly women, uh, family. Uh, they've got uh, teachers, it doesn't, you know, lawyers, it doesn't matter the profession really, but I've been looking at that. Yeah. And see, yeah. see who they you're are. You're a good businessman. You're catching on. Seeing who they are, what they do, uh, exactly. you know how they spend, and you put a piece in the puzzle for me. That was cool. right. I always ask anybody that buys my work, "What do you do? What kind of work do you do? What do you do for a living?" Many times they'll say, "Oh, I'm retired." Oh, well, what did you used to do before you retired? Because that has um, a idea of your demographics yeah. uh, as to what market you're appealing to who are buying your work uh, more so than <clears throat> how you are doing your style, who is it appealing to? Mm -hmm. And their best indications of where your work needs to go in the future is not from well-meaning friends and relatives and instructors, it's the people who buy your work. Mm -hmm. What it is they like or don't like about your work. <laughs> People who actually buy it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Who give you because money. that's the direction you should be going in in the long run. In the short mm -hmm. run, you can very, you know, go with uh, cutesy things and gimmicky things. But in the long run, you need to go in the direction of the demographics of the people who are buying your art. And I found right away in my first year, much to my surprise, the people who were interested in buying my work were those who had big homes in gated communities. And I said, what? How can I <laughs> believe oh, my prices are so reasonable? Uh, why is it that the people who are so affluent are interested in buying my work? Well, number one, it was different. Yeah. It had a different look to it, and it looked good from a distance, which meant a lot to them. I noticed home. that. People that are living in cottages, they like more of an illustrative style that they're because they're only a couple of feet away from the artwork in their uh -huh. living rooms or in their dining rooms, rather than twenty or thirty feet away from it. And their work washes out from a distance. Mine gets more vivid from a distance. I noticed so that. right away that became the type of buyer and they would buy several pieces at my prices rather than just one of an illustrator pride who had high price on it. Oh yeah those are yeah that when is, I set up the camera case. like from the camera you know you guys see you know this painting and it looks amazing. Blurry up close though. Yeah yeah no, let me see some of when you get within a foot or two it, it doesn't look so pretty at all. Here, let me get the camera to show the difference. Yeah. Yeah, no, it takes on a di whole different quality, you know, up close. Yes, in in intentionally. And then... So I'm know, trying to make it look good from a distance because that's my market. 
and then coming back here oop oh the rubber band flew off oh how funny oh i think I'm, let, let me see if i oh it's right here oh good so i'm gonna set this back up and again just from here it looks i mean it looks completely different that looks amazing but and i found that uh, so far as the uh, occupation is concerned a large the larger percentage of my buyers were, um, as far as the men are concerned, they were um, either in, in uh, investment, attorneys were the number one, doctors number two, and investment managers number three. Those are the, the three occupations that buy most of my work over wow. the years um, and come back for more. Wow. Wow, that's a, that's interesting. Um, and a large percentage of were self-employed. Uh huh. Yeah, not working for major firms. Uh, you know, if they worked for major firms, they were buying artwork for the walls in their offices. Why not? Why not teachers? And uh, do you see a reason? Why not teachers and housewives? And they don't have the budget. To okay. buy artwork. Okay. They're spending their money on necessities for the okay. kids and for the family. Uh, and artwork is considered a luxury for them. Yeah. When the kids leave home, maybe then their expenses drop, then they're looking at artwork and remodeling their homes or buying it, downsizing the sounds of the house and buying something new, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so, but until that time, it, it's a, a, what would they call it? A discretionary purchase. Yeah. <laughs> and many artists who, I mean, one of the best artists I ever worked with is a, that it's, he was a good instructor. Uh, he says, I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, realize in a cold sweat, realizing that my whole income is discretionary. <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> <in> my purchases. <laughs> in a it cold just sweat. Makes me uh, worry oh, how in the world am I going to make this work? Uh, if I don't teach, because it's, my buyers are, are buying it only when they have to, when they have the money to spend. Yeah, that's a it's total. It's the last thing that, on their buy list. That's a hard uh, proposition. They will take a, a vacation before they'll buy a piece of art because <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're man. so anxiety uh, from working every day for a paycheck. Yeah. So um, housewives are. Um, a good buyer only if their husband is making Boku bucks. Yeah. Uh, as an attorney, as a doctor, uh, uh, as an investment counselor, uh, and what have you. Um, trying to think of any exceptions to that, but uh, very few housewives, unless their husband just died and left a lot of money, <laughs> or they got a divorce settlement or something, right. have got the money to spend on art. That's the last of the least of their uh, needs. Uh, they think, uh, and they uh, they're very, very conservative in that respect. They want a deal if they're going to buy some artwork. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and but, they'll wind up buying a reproduction that's framed rather than an original because they're just looking for a wall decoration. Yeah, I think I got all my, you know, er everything that I was wondering about answered. Is there something that you want to say? So uh, just to wrap up, or uh, I was. Well, well, my old motto, price it low, let it go, uh, price it high and it won't fly. <laughs> it, it is, it's something that I always end with uh, on a note. And picking up a brush every day, even if it's only for 10 minutes, yeah. is going to get that brain connection with your neurological system that's so important. Yeah. Like picking up your musical instrument every day, say not the piano, whatever it is. Uh, it is very important to keeping things in tune. Yeah. If you go longer than a week or two or weeks, you're finding that that uh, is starting to slip away from you. Yeah. And your enthusiasm is starting to slip away from you. In my case, I start to get anxiety if I don't pick up a brush every day. Yeah. Uh, and it's like brushing my teeth or putting my shoes on, I'll pick up a brush. And it, even if I can only paint for a few minutes, uh, or a few hours that I will accomplish something and I'll feel like I did something that day. 
So yeah. That's more important to me than uh, even making a sale for the day, is that my picking up and working on a painting for the well, day. I definitely hear you on that. It is, is of all paramount importance. I mean, and it should be for me, serious artist as well. Well, you definitely help this artist out. Uh, Hurrah! Because, that's my important thing. Because getting, just getting to work every single day, you know, is just... It's my first instructor that I had when I didn't, when I got enough courage to take an art class at 48. I'd been painting as a hobby up until then, but strictly self-taught, because I didn't have courage enough to t take an art class, but I was sure I would be in the lower third, I'd be the worst one, you know. Uh, and I took my first class at the art college here, uh, and the first instructor I had showed me how to do saleable work rather than just pretty paintings. Uh -huh. uh, and I took a class from him every semester for three or four years, and then I did my first show and didn't go back to work after that. I asked him, what can I do for you? You have changed my life. I don't have to go to the office anymore. I have to go to that commuter traffic an hour or two every day. What can I do for you in return? You know, you change it. He says, pass it on, John. Oh, and that's what I've been doing with you today. Nice. And I have been doing for the last 30 years is passing my experiences on yeah. to other artists as much as I can. Whenever they show an interest, I'm willing to share it with them because it, it comes back to you. Okay. And it, uh, it's, it has a boomerang effect, a karma effect, whatever you want to call it, what you send out there to other people in a way of uh, uh, <clears throat> good information and goodwill and s providing a service to your customers like going to their homes, you become their personal artist. It all comes back to you with, yeah. as much as what you're willing to share. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to hold it to yourself, not share any of your secrets, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> you're never going to be <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, share your techniques with others and share your knowledge with others as much yeah. as possible. And that's what the best instructors do. And it comes back to them in the way of sales. Yeah. Uh, they find that uh, one supports the other uh, very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, the money you make income really is peanuts from sales. Co I mean, from teaching compared to what you make from sales in the long run, especially your commission sales. Uh, well, we're going to put this out on the... Uh... Uh, on the inter internet, we're gonna have it on Facebook, probably Instagram, and hopefully somebody, you know, somebody else other than uh, just me. I mean, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure somebody else is gonna get. Thank you. Uh, I'm only right. amount of value from this. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>